From the Kumi studio, where the truth is still true, comes a show that gives you a reason to live. My guest today is Jeffrey Deskovic, wrongly convicted and served 16 years in a penitentiary. How you doing, Jeffrey? Um, I'm great. Happy to be here with you, Pat, in, in studio, and uh, happy to be free. Yeah, I bet. It's a, it's the a kind of experience we can't really comprehend. Most people uh, think about 16 years, of, uh, and it's, it's just incomprehensible, the amount of time that you, that you spent in there. You were only 17 when you were convicted. Correct. So, uh, I mean, geez, I don't, where to start, you know, um, on getting out, you know, what was uh, what were your first thoughts? My first thoughts were, and, and I was quoted in, in the journal news, by the way, uh, is this really happening? <laughs> so I, I wasn't quite sure that I wasn't still on my bed in the in Elmira Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison, and, and just, you know, I just finally lost my mind. Uh -huh. I wasn't sure if it was that or did this uh, this uh, dreamed of day, was it actually uh, uh, in uh, unfolding in front of me? Yeah, and probably pretty similar then to the thoughts that you had when you were convicted. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, very, very surreal. It does. It definitely, uh, definitely had that uh, in common for sure. But uh, this was something good. <laughs> right. Whereas this was an incomprehensible nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it was you were uh, wrongfully convicted for murder and and also rape. Correct. Of a 15-year-old girl, uh, Angela Correa, I believe her name was Correa. Correa. Mm -hmm. Who uh, was uh, someone you knew from school? She was a, a, a classmate. Why? Uh, I mean, how did you come to be associated with this crime at all? Sure. So there was uh, three factors. Mm -hmm. So first was the police interviewed a lot of students from the high school, and because I didn't fit in, so some of the those kids told the police, "Hey, you might want to talk to Jeff." So I guess the theory is people that uh, don't quite fit in, that uh, are to themselves and a little strange, commit heinous crimes. I guess that's the philosophy. Oh, man, I would have been screwed. So that's one. Yeah, it, it could happen to you. Yeah. Uh, second thing was um, I, I was kind of a sen sentimental uh, person, and this was my first real brush with death. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, this kind of hit me kind of hard, and the police interpreted my being emotional and upset as an uh, outward manifestation of my feeling sorry for what I had done. Oh, okay. Wow. What a strange way to take that. I've never heard of that before as, like, uh, uh, remorse being uh, interpreted as guilt. I, I would agree, and I want to add that you know, there hadn't been a murder in Peekskill for maybe 20 years, and it shook up the whole city uh, to the point where free mental health services were offered to anybody. So I wasn't the only one who was upset. That's my point. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, third, the third reinforcing factor, though, Pat, was that the uh, Peekskill police, they got a profile from the NYPD, uh, which detailed what the profiler thought the psychological characteristics were of the of the criminal. And unfortunately, I happened to fit those characteristics, and so that was a reinforcing factor. So those three factors. Mm. And so that was when they started looking into you. Um, I suppose, I obviously, you didn't have an alibi or... Uh... Well, I did I did have an alibi. I was actually playing wiffle ball at the time that uh, the crime happened with, with a friend, and I told the police that, and I also later told my attorney that. Um, but let me put a little bit of, uh, add a little information. Please, yeah, anything you like, because I, mean, <laughs> I don't Thank know you. where to begin. It's, okay. it's going to be very smooth, Pat, and I, you're a great interviewer, by the way, I can feel already. Oh, uh, so for about six weeks, the police played this cat and mouse game with me in which when they, would, when, when they would talk to me, half the time they would talk to me like I was a suspect. And then when they would push too hard and I would start becoming frightened, I'd withdraw and I'd want to leave. Then Jeff is the junior detective helper theme was, was, uh, was uh, articulated by, by the police. So before I was a teenager, Pat, I wanted to be a cop. So this unexpected early opportunity to do this quasi-police work, along with my age, 16, was how they pulled the wool over the, my eyes and got me to keep interacting with them. That's powerful, too, for a teen, you know, especially when you have, like, a, a like you, you feel like you want to maybe be a police officer. These are cops listening to you, adults listening to you. Uh, yeah, that would be narcotic, I would think. Exactly right. And I want to add another thing was that my father was never in my life in any aspect. So when they played the good cop, bad cop routine, I began to look at the officer who was pretending to be my friend as a positive adult male role model, a father figure. 
Uh, and when you got when you're dealing with cops, you're trying to get a confession. It doesn't take in my age. It doesn't take a lot of figuring out that that's a recipe for a disaster. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, and speaking of your parents, I was wondering, like, where were they to make sure that you're not being uh, taken advantage of here? I guess uh, like if your dad wasn't in the picture, if you're, I mean, you know, your attorney maybe should have. Well, stayed. I didn't have an attorney at that oh, point, though. Right. This is this is we're talking all talking about pre-arrest. Got it. So my mother didn't know I was interacting with the police. Uh, she did know that there was one initial encounter. She didn't want me to talk to them. But, Pat, I'm 16 years old. We're at that stage. We know better. Our parents are stupid. We know better than them. But plus, also, I'm thinking, you know, I'm innocent. I don't know anything about this. And then they want me to help them. I mean, why shouldn't I talk? What could possibly happen? Sure. Well, yeah. quite, as it turned out, quite a lot. Quite, quite a lot. Quite yeah. a lot, actually. What an unusual teen, though, and what an unusual situation, you know, where you have to go behind your mom's back to confer with the police and help solve a murder. Right, and the police uh, knew all about my going around their back, and just uh, for for viewers, uh, it, that is legal, by the way. Uh, in New York State, if you're 16, you're considered to be an adult for purposes of being able to waive your rights and talk to the police without parental uh, consent. Oh, okay. I did not know that. So eventually the police got me to agree to take a lie detector test. They said, look, we got some no information in the file. We want to share that with you. You'll be able to be even more helpful to us. But you got to pass this polygraph first. You know, kind of like um, maybe how an intelligence officer has to be cleared for security by taking a polygraph. So kind of in the nature of that, they made it seem so nonchalant, Pat, like yeah. it was nothing. Well, they're allowed to lie. They are allowed to lie. And so I agreed to take the test. And so the next day, uh, instead of going to high school, I went to the police station where I thought the test was going to take place at. Uh, I thought it would take place there because other people in the city had been polygraphed there in connection with the case. And that's how the rumor mill went. Uh -huh. And so when I got there, they instead drove me to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County. So 40 minutes away, taking me across county lines. Now I'm not, I don't know where I'm at. I'm not able to leave on my own. I'm totally dependent upon the police. So when I get there, the polygraphist himself is a uh, Putnam County Sheriff's investigator, Daniel Stevens, and he's dressed as a civilian and he never identified himself as an officer. So he hands me this four page brochure with a lot of big words on it, which I don't understand. But then again, I dismiss my I dismiss my own concern because I think to myself, I'm here to help the police. What does it matter? Let's just get on with it. Sure. So there was no lawyer present. I didn't give me anything to eat the entire time I was there. Then they put me in a small room and the polygraphist gives me countless cups of coffee. Get me on edge. Get me nervous. Wire me up. And then he literally wired me up with the with the wires to the machine. So now I'm fairly immobile. I can stand up, but that's really the extent of it. And he launches into his third degree tactics. So he invades my personal space. He um, he raises his voice at me. He keeps asking me the same questions over and over again. He's getting very very ferocious as the uh, more ferocious as time is passing by. I'm not used to talking or interacting with adult males anyway, mm -hmm. in a way he's conducting himself and he's kind of like a mountain of a man and I'm 150 pounds and 16 years old. So it was very frightening. So sure. he keeps this up for about six and a half to seven hours. <sighs> Finally, he says, what do you mean you didn't do it? I guess he's exasperated at this point he, that he hasn't been able to get me to confess to, to that point. And so he says to me, uh, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the polygraph test result that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. And so that really shoots my fear through the roof. Yeah. And then the officer comes in the room who had been pretending to be my friend, and he told me that the other officers were going to harm me. I've been holding them off. I can't do this any longer. you got to help yourself. Look, just tell them what they want to hear. They'll stop what they're doing. You go home afterwards. You're not going to be arrested. So being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, mm. Not thinking about the long term. I, I just wanted to get the heck out of there. I was in fear of my life because the fact that I didn't know where I was. No one else knew it either. Mm. That loomed very large in my mind. Sure. I was so overwhelmed emotionally and psychologically. And then there was this push-pull dynamic. I mean, the possibility of harm has been thrown out there. And he's thrown me this false life preserver.
Yeah, but it's been thrown out there by the officer who is your confidant. Correct. Exactly right. Yeah, that's an important nuance that you picked up on. Yeah. Yes, it's exactly right. Yeah. And so I made the decision to make up a story based on information which they gave me that day and in the six weeks run up So to to it. And so by the end, uh, I, w I collapsed on the floor into a fetal position, and I was crying uncontrollably. Sure. Obviously, I was arrested. I was charged with uh, murder and rape. Yeah, immediately. Immediately. Yeah. Wow. You know, uh, I, most people wonder, I think, how, how do false confessions happen? And I can certainly see that, you know, in this case. Uh, I mean, uh, like threats, this. false promises, the, the, the age, the length of the interrogation, food deprivation, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the psychological tactics. I mean, really, for all intents and purposes, Pat, mm -hmm. they were overreaching me because I'm a 16 year old. And these are all these are adults. Yeah. And and really you've given consent to, to whatever degree as 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 an adult, you know, right. as, as, which is uh, unreal. And you had no idea what rights you had or anything no. like that and they're certainly not telling you. Uh you uh, yeah, in fear for your life, you'll do anything. Correct. You know, it's say whatever needs to be said. So now you've been arrested. Mm -hmm. Um what now? You know, I mean, like, uh, were you, um, you probably were not uh, given bail. Well, I was in jail for about 35 days, and then I did get bailed out. My, my mother at the time had a, uh, had, had a boyfriend who was a well-to-do businessman in, in uh, Peekskill. He owned a carpet store. And when he bailed me out, uh, he took a lot of heat for that. That was a media moment in and of itself, and his, his business suffered as a result of that. Damned. Uh, so before I go to trial, the results of a DNA test come in from the FBI lab because uh, semen was found on the victim. That didn't match me. That should have ended the case right there, you would think. Yeah. But the prosecutor got the medical examiner to commit fraud. He suddenly remembered six months after doing the autopsy, hundreds of autopsies later, he now remembers there was medical evidence that he forgot to document, which showed that the 15-year-old victim had been sexually active, and therefore the prosecutor took that and was able to argue, well, maybe she slept with yet another person prior to Deskovic murdering and raping her. The DNA doesn't mean he's innocent. Mm, but your DNA was not correct there at all. At all. No, yeah. it was not. Of course. So, uh, and then he takes it a step further and he names another high school student by name. He claims must have slept with the victim, but he never had the DNA performed to prove that. He didn't even call him as a witness. He made this unsupported argument to the jury. That this would be the guy based on uh, her contact with this uh, yes. individual. Correct. And um, this guy was probably the last person who would who would commit uh, a murder. Well, they weren't alleging he murdered her. They were saying that she she had voluntarily had sex with him. He was a jock. Oh, no, that's what he I was mean. A popular... he, he was somebody who would easy, easy sell as not the killer. Correct. Right. Yeah, correct. Yes. But just I want to just share in hindsight that the, this other person that they were mentioning, yeah. he never knew that his name was being thrown around in court. Right. He had no idea that he was basically being used as a weapon against me indirectly. He had, he had no idea. No, it had nothing to do with him. And it had nothing to do with him. And he basically plucked a guy out who would be like the most the um, easy to, to recognize as a non-killer, a very popular student. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, well, exactly. Right. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yes. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's incredible that they're going to that length. I guess they really like to close cases. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. They Especially didn't the first murder in Peekskill in over 20 years yes said, sir they, they want that thing done we have a guy we like him for the murder and uh why not you know he, he suits he fits a profile uh and we uh, think profiling is a good thing in terms of you know uh capturing uh killers or whatever yeah. in this case i suppose that's that that sort of let uh, you down i where was DNA evidence at at the time? This is in the 80s. This is 89, right? Well, I was arrested in 89. The trial was in 1990. So DNA uh, first crept up on the scene uh, 1986, 1987. This is so, brand new. So it's, it's relatively brand new. It's like three or four years old, mm -hmm. give, give or take. Uh, so my defense attorney basically didn't defend me. He never interviewed or called my alibi as a witness. He That's stunning. 
Uh, here's a whopper. See what you think of this one. Uh, he never explained to the jury the significance of the DNA not matching me. And he didn't use the DNA to argue that that proved that this so-called confession was coerced and false. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of one on one. I think, Pat, you would know to do that. And as uh, far as I know, you're not a lawyer. Well, you mean, would know to do no, that. I'm not though, a lawyer. Right? And but I, you, would know, you would know enough to do that, right, instinctively? I would think, yeah. If I didn't know that, I would at least know enough to get somebody who knows what they're doing on this case. This is serious. Right. It went, uh, right. It you went, had a public defender. I did have a public defender who had a reputation, by the way, of being their best trial lawyer. So his actions in this case are kind of puzzling. I'd hate to meet one of their mediocre trial lawyers. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. Because how could you blow it any worse than that? Didn't point out the significance of the DNA not matching. Didn't call your alibi. And here's a great this person one. can't still be practicing law. Uh, he's st uh, he, he still has a law license. Here's, here's, here's one arguably better than, than those two. When it's time to cross-examine the medical examiner to discredit him, you know, to show his fraud, to make the DNA evidence stand up, mm -hmm. he stood up in open court and he said to the medical examiner, you're going to be pleased to know that I don't have a single question for you. Wow. I mean, is, is this guy honest? <laughs> exactly. You know, he should have never represented me from the first place because of a conflict of interest. So this other youth that the prosecutor was falsely claiming likely had slept with the victim uh -huh. was represented by another member of, of Legal Aid Society of Westchester. So that conflict prevented the defense from calling him as a witness, from the defense from asking for a DNA test. He was unable to to do that. Correct. Because he was uh, he because he otherwise had retained uh, their what it would the their government uh, whatever. Um, they, he, they were, he was conflicted. But the lawyer who was supposed to be super legal aid society or whatever correct. it is. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the lawyer who was supposed to be supervising him uh, was representing this other youth. Okay. So the, ha, you can see what's going on there, right, Pat? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, let's just let's leave that part of it out. Yeah, as far as he's concerned, and um, but that to me, that's the least of it. That right. shouldn't even be. That's unnecessary, even. You know, I mean, like if if everything else would have been done, that would be just a just a detail. I mean, starting with the DNA, starting with your alibi. Right. He didn't even check. Correct. He completely disinterested, this attorney. And I mean, I don't mean to just like focus too for too long on this uh, on your shitty legal representation, but I mean, it's hard to imagine it being any worse. So, I mean, and and at the time, you're 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going through your head? Yeah, you know, I, I don't understand what's going on. But every time I ask him about his strategy, his you know his attitude is, look, uh, I'm the lawyer. You're not. Sit back. Let me do my job, kid. Look, you already thought you knew better than the adults once by you even speaking to the cops when your mother didn't want you. Don't make that mistake again. Just You just sit back and let me do what I do. I'm the lawyer here. Wow. And I don't know any better. And then he won't talk to any of the members of my extended family, like you know, my, my uncles or any other adult. He takes a very strict view of attorney client where he won't any of the strategic decisions like whether to go with a jury trial a bench trial whether to take the witness stand or not he, he i don't understand the implications of these decisions but he won't allow anyone any other he won't discuss it with any other adult who could lend their judgment to me and weigh in mm. so i was completely in over my head it's heinous and you did after your uh, exoneration get a settlement, a couple. I did. Right? From I the did. state and yes. um, Peekskill or yes. Federal. Yes, okay, so yeah, I'll explain. So New York has compensation, so I got, I sued in state court, I got compensation, but then I also brought a federal civil rights lawsuit in which the defendants were uh, Westchester County because their medical examiner committed the fraud and they settled with me. Okay. Another defendant was Peekskill because they suppressed, they, they interviewed about uh, 17 witnesses who knew the victim in one capacity or another, and they all told the police, she doesn't have any boy, she didn't have any boyfriend, there was no consensual sex. But they never documented those witness interviews, and so that was never turned over to my lawyers. So based on those- it was undocumented. Correct, we did never they, knew about they, that. Did they use it in court? No, we okay. didn't. We didn't know. They, they they hid the fact that it happened. 
So my trial lawyer, the defense, we didn't have that to work with at the trial. And if they didn't bring it in, is it still considered a Brady violation? It is. Okay. It is. Yes. Uh, a third a third thing was, a third defendant was Westchester Legal Aid for incompetent representation, including the alibi. Okay, good, good. They settled with me also. Okay. And the last one I settled with, uh, excuse me, the last one, last defendant was Putnam County because it was their polygraphist. And him, Daniel Stevens, I went to trial against, and I won a civil uh, judgment against him. Uh, okay, so you you ran the table on I that. ran the table on them. Nobody escaped, Pat. No one who had a hand in it escaped. Nor should they. Correct. As, as you get convicted of this mm -hmm. of this murder and rape, and you were sentenced to how long? 15 to life. 15 to life. Because I was charged as an adult, which that's why I got the adult sentence. And that's also why I was sent to a men's maximum security prison, El Elmira Correctional Facility. Oh, my God. Which is some, I mean, you're obviously not prepared for that. No. I don't know that anybody ever could be at Correct. any age. And Correct. so you are, uh, you know, thrown in with the, the most hardened, uh, is this a state yes. facility? Or it's federal? a state facility. State. Okay, mm -hmm. wow, okay. Which is the worst. Yes. From my understanding. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, the moment the gavel comes down on that, you must be in despair. It's it's I amazing am. you're still alive. I, I would agree with that. Sure. I, I agree. You know, I, on, when the day I was sentenced, I uh, begged the judge to overturn the verdict, and I referenced the DNA to support, you know, that I was innocent. Mm -hmm. And he said to me on the record, he said, maybe you are innocent. And yet he didn't overturn the conviction. He he took the easy way out and sentenced me. Wow, that's uh, he's sentencing somebody who he uh, allows maybe is innocent. Uh, he's I mean I suppose uh, that's what you would call a reasonable doubt. It sounds yeah sure I would agree. <laughs> Jesus, it's almost like they uh, they all took their. Uh, their cues from you know the from each other on how to convict somebody whether or not uh, they they belong uh, in in prison and uh, when you wanted the DNA evidence to be looked at also uh, I'm trying to I, okay I, so I know, also, I know you're going at judge yeah it was a famous judge so uh, well she's a judge now on television she plays one on television let me <laughs> qualify and say that she's not a real duty. judge yeah no 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 this is um, Judge Janine Pirro yeah. Okay, so, uh, so she, she wasn't the DA when I was convicted, but she did take office before my first appeal was decided. So it was her and her office that fought me in seven appeals, blocked, got the court to turn all my appeals down, including having the federal court rule that my being four days late was more important than my issues, a lateness that was caused by misinformation by the court clerk. But if that wasn't enough... She also blocked me from getting further DNA testing. So in 1997-98, the DNA data bank was created. So I wanted that further testing. Prior technology was you could just like one-on-one -on -one testing, like one suspect to the sample. I wanted to get the testing to put the crime scene DNA into the data bank, which had profiles of other people who had been convicted of crimes. Mm -hmm. And I, but she blocked me from doing that twice. Jeez, and you have to wonder why would her, why would she? I, I, it maybe has some kind of law and for uh, law uh, and order type mentality that um, prohibited that, but was like ill advised and 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 um, not not correctly applied. Definitely not correctly implied for sure. Mm. So then I go to the parole board and I get and I stand on my innocence rather than expressing remorse and taking responsibility. So that well, that's a good move. I agree. <laughs> I would agree. It's be, one of the best things I ever did, but it also resulted in my being turned down for parole. So now I get to do another year. I, I now I got 16 years in, and uh, at that point, three things, three factors came together that one. Uh, Millennium, okay. However you want to. I got. I wound up with the Innocence Project representing me. Uh huh. Second thing, Puro left office, <laughs> and number three, um, that the we got lucky that the actual criminal uh, killed a second victim three and a half years later, for which he got caught, which resulted in his DNA being put in the data bank, so that when I got the testing, it matched him. Lucky for you. Lucky for me. Yeah. 
So my charge, my conviction was overturned, and then uh, at my next court appearance, everything was dismissed on actual innocence grounds, whereas the actual uh, criminal was arrested and convicted of the crime, and he uh, pled guilty to it. He also he confessed not just to law enforcement, but also to a reporter on video camera. So. Just for everyone to be clear, the DNA matches him. He pled guilty. He, yeah. he confessed to a reporter and a cop. There's no false confession. He was even there. an adult. He was even an uh, that's something. Put the chair. He was even an adult. Yeah. Yes. And he was already and he's he's connected to it through the uh, semen. Yes, the DNA. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, correct. As you said, and and already convicted. How long was the sentence that he was already serving? He was serving 20 to life. But at that point, he was caught for the first murder he committed, uh, killing the victim in my case. He already had 13 years in okay. off that. So he was on the downside. He had like seven years left before his first parole board appearance. So, yeah, he has no, uh, It's he has a huge motivation not to confess to something he didn't do. Right. It's not like he's there forever anyway. Correct. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, did, did you ever meet this guy uh, afterward or anything like that? Or? Well, I came to court when he, when they were bringing him back and forth to court. I, I did attend because I considered that he victimized me in a way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was in the room when he was deposed. So my civil rights lawyers called him as a witness in order to prove that the police coerced me. And they gave me, they fed facts to me, which I repeated and the way he factors into proving that is they had him testify as to how the crime actually happened. And the way it happened is not the way that I confessed to. The way I confessed to was in line with what the police theory of it was. Okay. So that was how he fashioned. So I was in the same room with him, but, uh, but you can't, you, there's no free conversation in that setting. That's like a judicial proceeding. I see. Would you mind talking about the difference in the way the police had imagined it occurred and, you know, how it did actually occur. No, I wouldn't mind. No, okay. I wouldn't mind at all. No. So their theory was that, that you had killed uh, Angela Correa. Angela Correa. Uh, how? I mean, how did they yeah, imagine they, this happening? Yeah, they imagined that there was three different, there was three, there was, that there was three scenes within the general crime scene, that, that place where I uh, initially uh, encountered her, then a place where I uh, ran and tackled her, and, and killed her, and a third scene where they said that uh, I dragged her body to and covered up with leaves. Whereas what he, how he said the crime happened, she came upon him, and he happened to be in the park and high while she was in the park taking uh, photos, and that uh, that he attacked her, she ran away, and then he uh, he, he killed her. Okay, just all, it all happened right there. Right, right, one, right, all in one area, all in one. Like, yeah, she he attacked her. She tried to run. He grabbed her. So really, it's it's one scene, not not three. Yeah, that tried to run uh, after he like I, I suppose he uh, ejaculated on her uh, or in, yes. uh, after he had caught her, not correct, uh, not prior to her running away. Correct. Okay, got it. Okay, so uh, you must have been. Uh, astounded that OJ got off. Yeah, I really, I really, I really, uh, I really, I, mean, we all I, were. I really was. You know, there were a lot of prisoners uh, in, in 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 Elmira that after the verdict, they said, you know, there's a lot of us in here that they had far less evidence against us than what they did against uh, uh, against uh, OJ. Mm -hmm. To this moment, it never occurred to me what people in prison were thinking who were convicted killers. Uh, who were convicted of murder, who didn't do it, you know, even more so, what they thought of O.J. Uh, being being cut loose. And so uh, were, were, there, were they cheering like they were? In some yes. Places? <laughs> yes, they certainly were. Che All right, so I remember, I remember I was in Downstate Correctional Facility and the verdict was read over the televisions. And when the, 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 suddenly from out of nowhere, there was like a tremendous amount of applause and yelling and people shaking the bars and going, yeah! Yeah, it was it was uh, it was like you were watching a, a, a sporting like a football game. Was it along racial lines? It, it was. Okay. It really was along along racial lines. Yes, it was out here too. So it was yes. the exact same. Correct. Prison was a microcosm of society in that instance, for sure. How interesting. Now you 
Well, you must have learned a lot while you were in. I did. I used to go to the law library all the time to try to learn the law because after my trial lawyer had let me down, there was no way I was going to rely on a lawyer again. No. So I'd accept help, but uh, I would go to the law library and learn the law, and I'd want to give ideas and send cases and stuff. So an old timer schooled me on how that was important to do that, and so I, I did that. I, I embraced that. So learning the law gave a sense of empowerment and me being proactive, which tied into my morale. Uh, and that was an education you continued after you got out? Correct. And now you're an attorney? Uh, yeah, I just I just graduated law school oh, okay. and I uh, took the bar exam and I'm waiting for the results. And once that happens, I have to do a few minor steps and then I'll get the law license and I will I will be uh, I will be an attorney. You think you're going to criminal law? Oh, without a doubt. That's why I did it. So I have a nonprofit organization, uh, the Jeffrey Duskovic Foundation for Justice. So I was able to get some compensation as we talked about. It took me five years, but I used some of the money to start the nonprofit because I wanted to reach back and free other people that were in the same position I was. And we've been able to free seven people in six years. It's fantastic. So I went to law school because, and I had a master's degree before that that I had gotten from John Jay College. When I got out, I got a scholarship from Mercy to finish the bachelor's degree. I was 10 classes short of that. The funding haven't been cut from prisoners. So I finished the bachelor's and I went to John Jay. You were within, you were within 10 credits of finishing 10 your- classes. 10 classes of finishing your degree. Yes. And uh, they cut funding for prisoners. Yes, okay. correct. That's- which is you crazy. Had a lot of bad luck. I, I really have because the uh, the recidivism rate for prisoners with college education is, is uh, very very low compared to the national average is sixty eight percent. Oh. So it, it really was a was a was a dumb move on many levels. So I did get I did get the scholarship. I got the bachelor's in behavioral science thanks to the scholarship from Mercy College. Uh, I went to John Jay College. I got a master's degree. I studied criminal justice. My thesis was written on wrongful conviction causes and reforms. And from there, uh, you know, I, I reached the point that I wasn't satisfied sitting in the front row in the courtroom on foundation cases. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be able to sit at the table and, and directly address the judge and represent some of the clients. So hence my foray into law school, which I just graduated from the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Peace University in White Plains, just a mere nine and a half blocks from the courthouse where everything went wrong. Wow. So I graduated law school. I'm waiting for the results of the bar and um, looking. So I'm going to do practice criminal law. That, that, that's how we got off on this branch yeah, of conversation. I, I, I want to exonerate say. some people myself personally as a lawyer, and I want to help them get compensated afterwards. If I was ever accused of a crime, you're the one I would want. Yes, you know, you know that I'm going to go the extra mile. You know I'm going to be very thorough. I have an in inherent uh, motivation. And you understand what's at stake. And I understand exactly what's Driven at stake. Driven by something other than money. Correct. And, you know... Uh, Definitely beyond, way beyond your heart being in the right place. You know all the ins and outs, the angles, and yes. exactly how uh, some of these institutions can work. You know, Correct. Against a defendant, uh, whether right or wrong, it's Correct. just the way it is. Yes. Uh, it's um, there, that, that I did not know the recidivism rate was so high, 68%. And for those with uh, with the education you mentioned, it's yeah, much, so, much lower. Yeah, so Hudson Link is a nonprofit organization, which I'm a modest donor of, that brings college education to prisoners after the state had cut the funding. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they raise money and they, they partner with local schools and bring college education to some in some facilities. And so their their percentage, they're at two percent. Oh, great. That's fantastic. Yeah. It just it, well, it also stands to reason that people that are interested in education, and although they're locked up, are probably less likely to reoffend anyway. So you're of course tapping into the 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 top shelf of you know, I, I mean I understand like uh, half of adults are functionally illiterate now anyway, which is uh, stunning. You have already kept. Uh, you, what you, you say seven people out of yes. prison or yes. you kept them out or were they no, no, already no, no, in no, no. and you've sprung them? No, they were already in wrongfully uh -huh. and uh, I sprung them. Now, how did me these and the founders, other other team, not me by myself. There was people who helped me. I assume that they, that. they just, <laughs> right. just to be clear, I'm not a one man nonprofit. I do, right. I do have other, I do have plenty of other credible You're not people. Just sending a file and a cake or something and uh -huh. get out. This is like obviously you're right. uh, going to great lengths to do this. And yes. I assume there's an application process. There is. And so how do you call these down? I mean, how do you yes. know somebody who? When you look at these cases, what what signif what shows you a promising case? Okay, so there's two factors. We we look at somebody's innocence claim, 
And so part of that is looking at what has been used as evidence against them. And we compare, say if it's a confession case, then we look at what are the red flags in other confession cases that ended in DNA exoneration? What are the common characteristics of those cases? And compare that to the case that we're looking at. So there's red flags around, you know, confessions, identification, informant testimony. Uh, it's known what junk sciences are. So part of our analysis of the innocence claim is we look at what's used as evidence. Around the confession. Right. Or, well, well, it could be any, or on a confession, identify any of the evidence, identification, an informant. We look at that, yeah. and then, uh, and then we also uh, strength of the evidence. Strength of evidence, evidence. correct. But that's only half the equation. The next part of the equation is viability. If we believe someone's innocent, but we don't see a path to victory, we have to pass. So we look for a route. So whether that's DNA testing, whether there's an alternative suspect, if there's similar crimes in nearby areas, if we uncover documents that have been withheld, whether we think witnesses were less than truthful on the stand and we have to go and re-interview them, if there are new witnesses that have bubbled to the surface. So all those are techniques on a, on a non-DNA case. And that must be heartbreaking to have somebody who you believe is innocent, but you just can't. Yes see a way to, 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 to fix it. Correct. That, that keeps me up at night. So what we do in those situations, and I, this is better than a, a blank, is um, when, they, when those people go to the parole board, we send a letter to the parole board outlining primary and secondary reasons why we believe that they're innocent and we urge the board to release them. That must be... Uh hugely appreciated oh it really is it, it, it really is and uh, we're, we're we're four for nine on that by the way wow that's great that's fantastic I mean because who knows uh, who knows what happens without that letter well in some of the instances uh, I know exactly what has happened so there were there was one person that that we did that for and they had been denied parole six times before they went there the seventh appearance with our letter mm -hmm. another person was was denied seven times. So we, we know what has happened without that uh, letter. So, right. Know. They go back. That's they go it. back. Yeah. What do you think of the parole board these days letting out, um, you know, some, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some, some convicts who are pretty, uh, they seem dangerous. I'm talking about uh, the, uh, you know, the cop killers and, mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, the parole board has, has certainly uh, become politicized. Uh, it would it has, seem. It has, yeah, sure. Has that affected the work that you that you do in terms of um, talking to the way you address the parole boards, or I mean, like uh, in in in, in well, sending that breakdown? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. Of, yeah, yeah. It, it really it really does because we. So when George Pataki became the governor, you know, the whole the parole board changed. Then I mean, before that, uh, you you could be in prison for a violent crime. That's why you're sentenced. That's why you lost your freedom. And when you finished your time, then uh, as long as you could show you were rehabilitated, you could expect to make the first parole board. And if you deny, were denied, you certainly were going home your next appearance. But when Pataki became the governor and, you know, he started changing the parole board uh, commission, the governor appoints those positions, then suddenly anybody who was there for a violent crime would be turned down, even if they could show they had been rehabilitated. So that uh, aversion to paroling anybody who's been convicted of a violent crime, that there's still some, that, that, that there's still reverberations of that philosophical change. Mm -hmm. And so that that drives when we send the letters, we really do everything we can in illustrating that someone is innocent to try to to try to counter that because we know that that's one of the factors that's going to be weighing uh, against uh, our client. Mm -hmm. I see. In in. Uh... But let me just say one thing. I I feel very strongly that. Uh, when somebody finishes their time, you know, when they, when they and and uh, they can show they've been rehabilitated. Right? I don't think anyone should be released just or, or automatically. Okay, I don't think that. But I think if somebody can show that they have been rehabilitated, as demonstrated by their educational record, as demonstrated by their disciplinary record, as demonstrated by whatever pro. Sometimes people participate in programs that give back to society. So in those cases, and when people have committed crimes a long time ago, and they're different people now, they were young and foolish then and they're a different person now what is to be gained by continuing to incarcerate somebody that otherwise could be released and could be a tax-paying law-abiding citizen sure 
Yeah, I feel I feel strongly about second chances uh, when when they or when they are when they're warranted. And let me say this: or when okay. they and, and, and as, when you come up with the information that you send, when they may have been innocent to begin with. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I'm saying apart, separate and apart from innocence. Uh -huh. I'm just saying, just in cases when people are guilty. Right. I'm saying that when they've been rehabilitated, they they should be released because if. We're gonna, as a society, if we're gonna just keep denying parole to people who are guilty because of what they've been convicted of, well, that was known before the first day they served in prison. So let's just drop the pretense that we believe in rehabilitation. Okay. But if we're gonna say that we believe in rehabilitation, then we should live up to that as, as a society. Yeah. If and, someone and, can and be released safely, why shouldn't they be released if they could be released safely? Right, and there's no reason because some and and I, I think that sometimes they uh, it, it has become politicized here in New York with Cuomo. I mean, I'm right. not, I, just, I don't love his parole board. I don't like. I, right. Is it the PLA that I'm trying to think of? PBA, the, 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 the Policeman's Benevolent Association. Oh no, the uh, the uh, uh, no. the group that where the um, where they they killed cops back in like the 70s or whatever. Yes. The anyway, the, I, it, it's. It's become now uh, this this different deal. I don't know. It's it's it, it shouldn't be a liberal or conservative thing in Correct. my mind. It shouldn't be politicized at it all. It should not be some kind of a set of objective standards. You know that we could all deal with. You know would be the way. To, but I guess it's not always strictly objective. You know, is it? it? It's it's often not. And let, let me let me say this. Okay, that look the the policeman is 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 an essential person in society. They protect us. They pre prevent lawlessness. Is why this law and order. Okay. Okay, I instruct, I'm certified as an instructor in police academies in New Jersey. Oh. So they bring me in to do the ethics and I push in there some best practices, techniques that they, police officers can do, which can lessen the chance of them arresting the wrong person. Okay, so I have lots of photos with future officers and I'm friends with some officers now, so I'm not anti-cop. And, and, and I'm, I know you don't saying that, I'm yeah. saying that I'm saying that as a caveat to what I'm about to say. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm saying that as a caveat to what I'm about to say. Um, look, um, I don't think that a police officer's life is worth more than your life, my life, uh, the EM, the, the emergency medical technician, the teacher, the garbage man. I, I don't believe in putting lives, making different values of, of lives to where if you kill some people of some profession, then you can be paroled, you get your second chance, but not if you kill law enforcement. I, I don't agree with making the, li the li devaluing lives. That, that's the point of what I'm getting at. What about a Kardashian? <laughs> well, listen, you know what? Kim Kardashian, for whatever else could be said, positive or negative, she has used her platform, she's used her fame, she's used her access to other places in the government uh, to get the ear, and, and it's resulted in some people who are deserving of freedom being free. So yes. I'm happy that Kim Kardashian is proactively yes. involved, and I'm against the pushback, blowback, the criticism that other advocates give her. What would you prefer Kim to do? Not do anything at all and just let people, let things just take its course? Or you want her to use her platform and succeed in getting people released who should not be there? I submit it's the, the latter is, is, what, is where it's at. I would agree. She will. You know, they, they don't, nobody's supposed to deal with Trump at all. You know what I mean? The, the, if, if you have to talk to, to President Trump to get something done, then uh, then it's not worth doing. It seems to be uh, the, the take. For, and, that's, and that's too bad because, you know, you're going to leave people sitting in, in prison who have one conviction or, or what, whatever the grandma marijuana was convicted for. You know, right. I don't really know. Uh, apparently, she was didn't need to be in there forever, though. Yeah, listen. I, if we're gonna go by a litmus test, and and you have to agree with every single thing any politician, whether President Trump or someone else, does in order to work with them on anything, we're never gonna get anything done. Yeah. Okay, I believe in working with the people you can work with when you can work with them on whatever issue you can get something done for the good and and uh, forget the the rest of it so it seems pretty i would simple, have no it? yeah it, it really does mm. you know and and again for whatever legit criticism or otherwise that could be made as against the president mm -hmm. uh, he did sign the, he did sign the, the, the first first step act, you know, legislation, which did result in some prisoners on the federal level uh, who didn't need to be there uh, being being released. Yeah, some prison reform is definitely called for it, probably at all times. Uh, at, yes. At, at any point. When would you stop 
uh, inspecting a, a restaurant for health code violations, you know, never. Correct. So therefore, you have to stay vigilant, you know, about things like prison. There's always new developments, and uh, it's uh, it just seems like a no-brainer, you know, to always be looking into that. And yet, I don't know, like it's not always a, a, a top. Oh, if nobody, if Kim didn't go to President Trump, then then uh, Miss Johnson would still be in prison right now. Is yeah. anyone is anyone in favor of that? I can't imagine. <laughs> But then again, you know, some people are so intent on on Trump not getting a win of any sort. You know, I mean, like, not that it's not easy to ignore, but you know, I think that there's tons of people who would go scorched earth. Nothing good happens. The economy fails. Mm. But I don't want to. I don't know. I don't want to get into a whole Trump thing because no, uh, no, no, no. We're talking about criminal justice and criminal justice. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and everyone should know. Okay, if it's not obvious. Okay, I do not agree with what he did with the Central Park Five, running the full page ad calling for the death penalty. The, really? Or the boys were even uh, convicted, and we know they're innocent. So everyone knows all about that he did that. Obviously, we're against that. That's a different argument than saying, you know, it was right for people to go to him on other reform issues. And mm -hmm. maybe that'll be the last we say of, of the president, one way or the other. Right. Oh, I, I would love to talk to you about the Central Park Five sometime. Maybe yeah. not today. Sure. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah. There's I mean, I know, I, know, I, know, I know a lot of them personally. It's an enormous and, topic. Uh, no, it, it really is. And I'm so happy that they're exonerated. And I think it's a shame. Uh -huh. I think it's a shame that part of the police narrative that they're still saying even now to this day, trying to defend themselves and, and saying, oh, no, they're, they're, they're guilty. The serial rapist, Materius Reyes, who came forth and confessed, whose DNA it matched, okay, that, oh, he worked, he, he came afterwards, it doesn't mean the five were or were innocent. To, 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 to say that, they still say that they're guilty is, is an absolute uh, tragedy. It's, a, uh, it's an insult after injury. Well, uh, I mean, anyone who hasn't seen it should watch When They See Us which is an incredible four-part movie, uh, docu-series on their case. Uh, and then also the documentary that was done on their uh, case also called The Central Park Five. In my opinion, that is the best documentary on the intersection of race and wrongful conviction. Well, I mean, and, and I understand the idea that, uh, well, the solid principle, you know, that if their DNA isn't found, somebody else's DNA is found, uh, that they are not to be convicted of, you know, this thing that this guy has confessed to. That's a legal thing. Sure. There's, there's, you know, it's separate from everything is the law. Correct. Um, however, uh, what do you, did they have, do you think they had any involvement with no, the jogger? No, I do not. Really? No. Okay. No. That's interesting. Uh, well, listen, let, let, me, let me make an argument, okay? Let me tell you what part of that is based on. So that just this way you can evaluate, you oh, know, sure, come to sure. your own conclusion, and so can the listeners and the viewers. Uh, so the, the confessions in the Central Park Jogger case, four of the five um, defendants did, did confess. It was videotaped. And their story, they don't tell, four people commit a crime, right? It's five of them, right? Four of them confess. They should all be telling the same story. Right. But their confessions differ from each other in material respects. So to me, that's really strong. Uh, that's really strong that they didn't know what happened. And why wouldn't they know what happened if they committed it? Well, they, they, they didn't. That's that's the point. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I mean, now, I one thing I have not done is look at the confessions uh, word for word in relation to one another. Uh, so I, I, I really can't speak to that. Okay. Why do you think that the police still so strongly feel, and I'm talking about through mm -hmm. uh, the officer who uh, wrote the Armstrong report, you know, or mm -hmm. was involved with the composition of that, to, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody in law enforcement who didn't believe that they were guilty. I mean, uh, what's the, uh, what do you, what's that about in your mind? In my mind, it's because they don't want to admit that they did something wrong because, you know, as a general principle, people do not falsely confess if they're not coerced, if, if illegal tactics aren't a engaged in. It's the rare person, not impossible, but it's the rare person. You would need to be mentally, uh, have mental problems to just falsely confess without being coerced. And so I think that they're trying to cover up for that 
coercion. And I think that's some of it. And I think maybe maybe for some of them, some aspect of it is um, is that they want to distance themselves from what they what was done, and they want to try to keep the full honor and prestige of the profession of law enforcement fully intact. And that means not admitting admitting that something wrong was done there. But, uh, but again, I think that acknowledging that something's wrong doesn't cast aspersion on the profession. It means that those officers in particular, on that, on that particular case, in that particular instance, did something wrong. I don't think it brings down the whole profession. Just like I don't think that, I don't think that a good officers mean the whole profession's good. I don't think some bad officers mean the profession as a whole is bad. No, and I think that if, uh, like what you're describing would be happening on a subconscious level, you know, not, it's like belief is stronger in most cases than facts that people have or knowledge that people have. Belief stronger than knowledge. They believe that they, you know, that this is the way we find, you know, criminals, and, uh, you know, whatever, on whatever level they believe in one side over another. There so, was, a, I'm going to make a quick point, but I don't want to, so, and when I was uh, exonerated, you know, they, one of, I forgot the newspaper, but there was one article that uh, was about my being exonerated, and there was an anonymous source within that, that the reporter references, and he says, uh, to paraphrase him, well, um, I, I don't know why he falsely confessed, but I got to tell you, nothing improper was done. So that was in my case that was said. And I think that's kind of the same sentiment coming from the same place. Some of the same factors that I theorize could be the Well, it, well legally, probably nothing improper. I mean, well, no, no, a threat and false promise is illegal. That is illegal. That, but the, and, and and just like leaving it out of their testimony. Ah, I see. What they didn't te that my interrogation was not video or audio taped, and they were able to leave the threat and false promise out. That was not legal. Just like not inter not documenting the witness interviews was not legal either. Right. That was a Brady violation. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. But in the case of Central Park Five, all those interviews were certainly videotaped and they were. Is the coercion uh, evident in the uh, videotapes? Yes. Is it? Okay. Yes, it is. And, and they, they were even, uh, all of them except for Corey Wise, were even uh, even younger than I am. Mm -hmm. you know? And I want to also mention in the Central Park 5 case that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office agrees that they're innocent. So this is an instance where we have the DA's office splitting from the, the police department. The, man, oh, the Manhattan DA. Yeah, the Manhattan uh, DA. So, uh, <laughs> he, he finally did the right thing for once, sure. right? Uh, Cyrus. DA, no, no, no. This was uh, D. A. Uh, Morgenthau. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm not not familiar with him. Uh, to get it off the central. Sure, part of course. Five yes. And back uh, mm -hmm. on the work that you're doing now. Yes. Uh, would you care to go into yes. some of the cases that you uh, of the people that yes. you've gotten out? Yes, I would. I really would like That'd that. Be great. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes. So uh, definitely uh, William Lopez. Okay. So uh, he served 23 and a half years in a shotgun murder. Uh, so he had a pre-existing legal team that had been with him for nine years. So we came into the case in the last year. So it was kind of like a building was built but missing a section that we put in there. So the case against Bill um, started out, it was, it was two witnesses. But then one of the witnesses could not make an in-court identification. So now it's a one witness case. The one witness had been up, testified that she had been up for 24 hours. She had done 12 vials of uh, drugs. And um, she claimed that she was not getting a benefit for her testimony. But one day after Bill was convicted, she miraculously is let out of jail. Oh. Uh, his lawyers talked him out mm -hmm. of calling his two alibis as a witness. His lawyers. Uh, his lawyers did, yeah. So they dropped the ball. Uh, his case, Bill's case, aside from those facts, uh, leapt out at us because, and you wanted to know how you can you pick a case. It's going to become rather clear now what I'm going to say. Yes. So the there was an initial 911 call that said that the perpetrators were 6162 dark skinned Panamanians. Bill was five foot seven, light skinned Puerto Rican. And the description given was of some of people who are 100 pounds heavier than him. Wow. I think even you would pull the trigger on that case. 
Absolutely. I'm no. I'm look freeing uh, innocent people. But I'm saying the factors. Fa- fa- eva- no, no, of course. But I mean, yeah. evaluate. I'm, I'm saying in terms of being able to evaluate the factors and decide what you're going to go forward on or not. Oh, right. So that was one case. Any, anyone would, I would think. Now, I, I agree. How, how does this become a conviction? Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, it was it a jury or a judge. No, it was a jury, and there was prosecutorial. Uh, it was prosecutorial misconduct involved because the witness did in fact get. Uh, did in fact get uh, a, a benefit. And by the way, we found we found a witness who was present at the crime scene that had been deported to Dominican Republic. And that witness testified in federal court at the evidentiary hearing, uh, you know, via uh, Skype. So, uh, so he was exonerated. Sometimes deportations do affect a regular yes. day-to-day criminal court. Correct. Yes, it can. Uh, okay. So he was exonerated. Last thing on Mr. Lopez, uh, uh, Bill, I, he... Passed yeah, I away. Be on a first name basis. Well, we were friends. Right, we were also course. friends. We evolved you're into the best that. friend he's got. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 right. You're right. So, um, so you know, just talking about the speaking to the human cost of these wrongful convictions. So, Bill passed away uh, a year and a half after being uh, free. Mm. So he was in for 23 and a half. He fought the whole 23 and a half years, and then when he only lasted uh, a year and a half, so virtually his whole adult life was stolen from him by this wrongful conviction. My God. And the shame of it is, it seems like that does occur perhaps more often than, than you would think. You would yes, I believe the percentage is 15 to 20 percent. Die pretty soon after getting out? You oh, mean- no, no, no. I meant, I meant percentage of wrongfully convicted people in prison. Oh, oh, I see. Yes. Oh, oh, I think I, I think it's, well, That's I knew, high. I think, I, it's, look, 17 people were exonerated either before me or after me that I personally knew, that I personally did time with. So I don't believe it's a small 1%, 2%, half a percent, 5%. I, I think it's a heck of a lot higher than that. Jeez, yeah, I would say that seems to be. If you knew 17. Yes. And uh, they're not getting out if they are not wrongfully convicted. There's correct. There's just no way. There's just no way. somebody loose because maybe we don't know. No, no, because when you've been... Con- technicality or something like no, that. It's no, tec- like that. no, it's, it's, it's not. No, it's not. It's not because here, here's the thing is that when you've been convicted, the burden of proof shifts and now it's up to the defendant to prove that he's innocent, not the prosecution to prove that you're guilty. So it would be pretty close to impossible to come up with some new evidence showing that somebody uh, is innocent when they're in fact guilty. Right, reasonable doubt is out the window a long time ago, and now it's yes. like you have to, You got this has to be for sure. I, I would like to get into a case that was just reversed, but, but not dismissed. So Andrew Krivak. So he's a, this is a Deskovic Foundation case. So the same polygraphist who coerced the confession out of me with his polygraphist did the same thing to Andy Krivak. Of course. His code, look at how crazy this is. So Andy's co-defendant, Anthony DePippo, has been home for three years. He was exonerated. He's been home for three years. He's been compensated. He's in the middle of a federal civil rights lawsuit, he's listed in the National Registry of Exonerations, but his co-defendant on exactly the same set of facts has remained in prison for the last three years. And although the conviction has been overturned, lawyers at the foundation brought into the case were able to overturn the conviction, the Putnam County District Attorney's Office does not want to let go of that case, even though, despite what I've mentioned, and despite a mountain of evidence showing that uh, an alternative suspect, a serial rapist, who was initially the suspect, whose M.O. was the same as how the victim was found in this case, who confessed to a prisoner in Connecticut, because he's doing... 30 years in, in, in Connecticut for sex offenses. He lived a mile away from the crime scene. So despite all that evidence, they don't want to admit that they made a mistake. And so they're appealing the reversal. And thus far, he's been denied uh, bail. You know, recently, the all the witnesses in that case recanted and said that they were, uh, they were uh, threatened. The one witness that did not recant recently committed, admitted to committing perjury in Anthony DePippo's uh, lawsuit, the deposition. And the prosecutor, Larry Glasser, knew that, and he didn't disclose it to the court. In fact, in his court 
paperwork opposing bail for Andy Krivak, mm -hmm. said, you know, criticized the defense from casting aspersions on this witness. On this witness who admitted to committing perjury. Yes. I don't want to cast aspersions right. on that. So a recent motion has been filed by uh, Oscar Michelin, uh, who the foundation brought into the case, uh, and, and uh, co-counsel Karen Neworth. So they're seeking to have the bail application uh, reconsidered, to have a new bail hearing, and uh, moving to recuse the Putnam County DA's office because of this misconduct that they engaged in. They're not objective. Yeah. And then also seeking to dismiss the indictment because all the witnesses recanted. The one who didn't now admits to committing perjury. Uh, the uh, one of the key people involved in the confession, I want a civil judgment against for coercion. There is no case anymore. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, his uh, co-defendant is out. So yes. how did that happen, that, 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 this, that the co-defendant was able to uh, circumvent all this? Well, what they, so they were given separate trials okay. because uh, the polygraphist was able to coerce Andy Krivak into giving a false confession, and Anthony DePippo did not falsely confess. Okay. So they severed the trials. Now, that having been said, uh, Anthony, it's the same case other than that. So when Anthony was released, Andy should have been released also. You would think. You would think. But they, if they've got some kind of a legal way of not doing that, there's still that's what they want to do to, I guess, reduce their liability. Well, uh, I, well, they know that if he's released, that there's going to be a lawsuit. But then again, he should be compensated. Of course, yeah, uh, uh, and it's it, it's amazing. We need the courts to step up and to do the right thing. We need the public to demand that Putnam County DA Bob Tendy do the right thing and dismiss the case. And if he doesn't, we need the Attorney General. OK, to get in there and stop this injustice from going on every day that Andy sits in there extra. It, it, it makes it that much worse. Have you uh, appealed to the attorney general? Uh, we, we have not yet because the motion has just been filed in front of the court. We're waiting to see what the Putnam County D.A. is going to do. They may do the right but, thing. Yeah. Well, we're hoping. They haven't so far, but that's the first thing. Now that this new motion was just filed on Friday, so if they don't do the right thing, we certainly are going to be going to the Putnam. Uh, excuse me, we are certainly are going to be going to the Attorney General to, uh, to enter to intervene. You're talking about the the federal attorney, the attorney. No, 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 general. no, 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 New York State. state. No, New York State. Oh, okay. No, Letitia James. Yeah, the, the, the state. Oh. Look, either either you, either you have a conviction review unit in the age, Attorney General's office. Or you don't. Uh -huh. You can't keep saying you do, but yet on all these wrongful conviction cases that have ended in exoneration, there's nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so we need something. Now, granted, she just took office. Before that was Schneiderman doing nothing. But now it's he's a new a sheriff busy in man, town. Schneiderman. He was <laughs> he had yeah. his hands full with his uh, with his cocaine and women, I guess. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I went I heard that wrong. I, I went to him personally on the Johnny and Capier case. We were both there at a gala dinner of the Innocence Project, and I had Incapier with me, and I went over to uh, Schneiderman, and I knew I had relationship with him when back in his days when he was a senator. We had stood side by side together. I used he used to introduce a lot of wrongful conviction. Uh, prevention legislation. So we did press conferences. We worked together. I, I see. I, so I, I thought it would. I thought it would be different. I, I, I had the naive thought that this is me as a politician without being uh, wrongfully convicted. But it turned out not to be the case. So he became different when he became the AG. But coming back to my point is, I went to him personally and I said, "Look, his conviction's just been overturned. It's a very, very thick, well-reasoned decision going over all this new evidence, and yet the Manhattan DA." office, uh, Cyrus Vance, uh, is appealing the decision, seeking to put him back in, despite a 60-something page decision. Will you please intervene? Not one person has been helped by your office, and he's wrongful. Can this please be the first? And so he took information down, and he claimed he would, he would uh, ha have, look into it, and that they would reach out to his lawyer, uh, Ron Kuby, and bottom line, nothing happened. Jesus Christ. You went right to the guy, gave him all the information and nothing. Uh, then, you know, I, 
they can't be motivated. Uh, it would be my presumption. And, and he's gone now, so maybe Letitia James will be better. And uh, right. I'm, I'm hoping fans, that she I will. His, I don't know his deal. I, I don't get his office and, and, and the things that he likes to do. Well, he, and I, I'll tell you, his so-called, Cyrus Vance's so-called conviction review unit is, 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 a, is, a, is a complete uh, sham of a unit. Yeah. Uh, doing the wrong thing. The Incapier case, the, here's, here's one for you, the, right. the, the John Adrian Velasquez case. So, uh, multiple people, witnesses recanted. Uh, the alternative suspect, whose name appears in the early police reports, he confessed to several, he confessed to a civilian witness, uh, and, and uh, they still won't, they still, they still fight J.J. Velasquez on simply getting an evidentiary hearing to have his witnesses uh, evaluated and heard from in person. They won't even agree to that. Strange, very strange. I mean, I, in de Blasio's New York, it's hard to believe that this, that this kind of thing would, uh, you know, be such a problem to get through. Now, there was one cop who was in, within NYPD who uh, a few of his cases now have been overturned. Ah, that's Garcella. Yes, Garcella. Detective Scar. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he, the he last used count. The crackhead method, like you, before you mentioned. Correct. That. To use the same crackhead to uh, identify uh, seven people in in single eyewitness cases. So this witness yeah. had a habit of she had a habit of being in the right place at the right time. If yeah. you're a believer. And these crackheads are pretty unscrupulous when it comes to uh, mm -hmm. court testimony, aren't they? They certainly are. Yes. Look, they have every motivation to lie. They don't want to be arrested, and they're certainly vulnerable. Yeah. You know, and then they're given rewards uh, also. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people get uh, financial or even housing will, will relocate you. You know, it's all types of uh, all types of rewards. So yeah. Scarcella has had 13 cases of his that he arrest that he made uh, overturned. There's still a ton more people in prison who, who uh, that and he uh, that Scarcella participated uh, in uh, in in those cases in the and 90s so, mostly, right? Yes, correct. Very busy time. It, well, you know, the, the whole crack uh, academic uh, the explosion, one of the consequences of that is that the methods that the police utilized in trying to take back the streets and make it safe for all of us, uh, some of their unscrupulous methods, they went too far, and, and, and those, some of those methods led to wrongful convictions. Yeah. It's, uh, you I mean, know. Even in my case, the actual perpetrator was, was a drug addict. So and so so his, that motivated uh, him, mm -hmm. you know. So but so the drug explosion. I mean the the, the drugs usage, uh, you know, has has a factor. We'd refer, reference that witness. So sure. Yeah. I mean the whole goddamn city was a zoo for many years. Thank and, God that was cleaned up. Yeah. But but we need these wrongful convictions to be cleaned up. These excesses. You know the only one that that benefits Pat when when the uh, actual uh, criminal uh, uh, is actual criminal when a wrongful conviction happens. It's really a public safety issue because often the criminals are, are they they commit they commit a crime again. Like the victim they almost my, certainly will. Right. Well, the victim. The, excuse me. The, the the criminal in my case killed a second victim three and a half years later. So that 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 lady uh, Patricia Morrison was uh, a school teacher who had two kids. So she didn't need to lose her life. And so her blood is on the hands of uh, Putnam County and... Uh, mm -hmm. Big skill and Big the prosecutor, skill. yes. And uh, your shitty system. attorney. My attorney as well. Uh, I mean, yes. all of the above. It was a total systemic breakdown from start to finish. This, whatever else could be said, okay, this, my case, was not a good faith error. That's, that seems fairly sure. So... Thanks for taking the time. Oh, thanks for having Every, me. This was a very fun interview. <laughs> for pleasure sure. to talk to you. I feel like I could talk to you for another hour just about... Uh, I'd love to come back other... another time and talk about other criminal justice issues. I mean, certainly, you know, look, I was in prison, so I know about, you know, prison reform and, I've, uh, you know, prison reentry and parole reform. You know, tons of top nonviolent offenders, elderly in prison. Tons of stuff I don't normally get to talk about, but that I've witnessed firsthand and that I have my formal education. I certainly have some... In Opinions I can bring to the table and some perspective and sharing some information. Love to have another chance to come on and do Absolutely. it again. Absolutely, we'll do it again soon. And uh, in the meantime, how can people, um, you know, follow you, keep up sure. with you with what you're doing? Sure. So uh, my name's Jeffrey Duskovic, of course, um, D E S K O V I C. So we, I am on, uh, I am on social media. So I do have a public figure page uh, on uh, Facebook. Just type my name in there. Uh, certainly, they can go to my website, duskovic.org, D E S K O V. -I -C. 
www.ncic.org. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm Foundation very active. Foundation something people can donate to? It, it certainly is, yes. It's a 501c3, so there is a tax break involved. Here's my crazy dream, Pat. There's a crowdfunding site called Patreon. So if you go to Google and type in Patreon, then Deskovic, uh, in the page, you click on the link, you come up. Here's my crazy dream. What if 75,000 people could afford to part with $3 on a continual monthly basis uh -huh. that would give us close you know they'll give us like close to a million dollar budget we I have a whole plan on there we would hire lawyers investigators paralegals everything essential to run a really robust lean and mean efficient machine if I could do what I'm doing pass to helping to pass three laws and freeing seven people uh, on a shoestring what if, what what if uh, what could we do if we really were armed for bear and so you know that's my appeal to the public you know I've put a lot of time in I've put money in I, I can't do it alone. We need we need people to help, and that's a way that everyday people can help. You know? Patreon.com, and you know, remarkably, and maybe unexpectedly, we have very similar crazy dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three listen, dollars a month, people. Yeah, listen, I mean, could you could you, could you give up this cup of coffee once a month in order to free nice the wrongfully convicted? Bread. Yes, uh, it, it's true, yeah. but it, it it's true. It's cliche. And yeah, and you know what? It only a little bit from a lot of people, and oh, that get is a lot idea. done. Yes. Yeah, and so. Uh, I hope uh, people will uh, check that out. And we'll talk to you again soon, Jeffrey. Looking forward to it, Pat. Thanks Thank for you. watching.